كم مرة عصف الأنين بداخلي كم مرة قد ذاق قلبي من أساه محلته وكم كرهت مصابها لكن رأيت الخير يسكب في أنا كم مرة قد ضقت من عظام البحر بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين ما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته How is everyone doing? I hope everyone is in the best of health and iman, high spirits making dua for the believers around the world making dua for your brother, bro Haji and like once again it's a uh, Business as usual, BAU, <laughs> uh, for myself. Uh, obviously, I've had a long uh, break during Ramadan, you know, self-reflected, um, took a, a nice break, rejuvenated, recharged the batteries, and here we are. Now, over the course of the past three weeks, going on a month now, uh, there was a lot of focus on the uh, Zionist aggression, on our brothers and sisters in Palestine. Awalan fi Masjid al-Aqsa in Masjid al-Aqsa and thereafter the Udwan, uh, the aggression uh, on Al Gaza. So what has transpired from that is that the super salafists in the Madakhila basically doing damage control and speaking about events uh, you know, to just basically make it out like, you know what, we are voicing our uh, concerns and but, you know, they've always got to issue cheap shots and the Muslims indirectly or directly mock the believers to sort of um, hold them accountable for their misfortune and blame them and come back to the correct aqidah. Uh, and again, we'll get to this uh, in more depth as the video goes on. So what I'm going to do in this video as well, I'm going to slightly shock you as to um, their regular rhetoric that they use, presenting context, because as you know from the title, um, Salah Hadin an innovator, um, it's crucial because look, me as an Athari, and I, when I say Athari, I mean an Athari who affirms Allah's names and attributes. We're going to go into, when they say the correct Aqeedah, what do they mean by that? Okay, because it's very important now that we highlight this, because this uh, rhetoric that they use, um, it needs to be dissected, and clarity needs to be um, established upon the actual meaning of this statement and whether it holds any weight when it comes from the mouth of the super salafi and the madakhila and i always mention this uh, phrase uh, kalimatul haq urid biha batil or yurid biha batil that uh, a statement of truth meaning you ha we have to have the correct aqidah of course uh, but they are uh, intending falsehood so what we'll do is without further ado uh, let's now play uh, a video of Dawaman because this is a response to Dawaman and Shamsi together because like I said uh, regurgitate the same old uh, garbage and, and sewage uh, you know in relation to their methodology and how they promote it so let's listen to Dawaman first of all in terms of his uh, views regarding the Sha'ira okay just, just let's see how they behave because when we present Ibn Taymiyyah's statement and you'll be very shocked uh, to know what Ibn Taymiyyah and how Ibn Taymiyyah dealt with this issue. Now, I, I make the uh, point again, I am an Athari in connection to Allah's names and attributes who affirms Allah's names and attributes. I'm not a Mufawida. I affirm Allah's names and attributes in a manner that befits His Majesty. So just to get that out there, just in case, you know, like these um, uh, super Salafis, waste papers, they'll always like to, you know, uh, accuse their opponents and disrespect their opponents and insinuate they're this or they're that. It's nothing new. They 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 base their whole um, or they formulate their whole position based on uh, belittling their opponent. So I just want to get that out there. So let's listen to that one. The Quran properly, not fully, but better. When it comes than... to the Quran, Akhi, how much of the ayat of the Quran are talking about Allah's names and His attributes? How many ayat and wa huwa al alim, wa huwa alim wa kan Allahu aliyan kabira, wa kan Allahu aliman kabira, wa kan Allahu aliman hakima. How many? Allah seems to attribute they negate them. The Mutakalimin, Ashara, Mu'tazila, the Jahmiya, the Maturidiya, they have different nuances amongst themselves. So now, Salahuddin al Ayyubi, Rahmatullah Alayhi, they're kind of in a pickle because they've gone out there and used this um, position that in order for Nasr to be granted by Allah Azza wa Jal, you have to have the correct aqidah. So what we'll do is, let's play Dawaman, because this is a response to him and Shamsi, but let's play his 
clip now. So you heard him what he said probably about four or five months ago. So when we addressed his video uh, regarding, you know, uh, the only victory will be given if you have the correct aqidah, etc, etc. Now again, kalimatul haqq. You read behind about it. A statement of truth, but what they want from me is false. We'll, we'll, we'll break this down, we'll dissect this after we listen to his speech. I'm sorry, your ears are going to burn listening to this garbage. Honestly, this sewage um, that's going to be uh, spewed at his mouth. Honestly, I apologize. It's just absolute garbage. Have a listen. Salahuddin al Ayyubi was a man who was known to be uh, an advocate of the Ash'ari Aqidah. Uh, he was known to be a uh, an advocate of the Ash'ali Aqidah. Um, and then Allah Azza wa gave victory to the Muslims at his hands. Um, so why is it that you condition uh, correct Aqidah uh, to be the prerequisite for victory where we had a man who uh, his Aqidah according to uh, Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'a was an aqid of deviation and corruption, yet he still received victory. And then, what they extrapolate from that and they take from that story and that incident in history, uh, they use it as a proof. They don't use an ayah as a proof or a hadith, but they use that story, uh, which is from our history as proof to say that we don't need to work on our aqidah, we need to work more on our unity and on you know, our numbers and this, that, and the other. And, Whatever have you, and then Allah the will give us victory for that. So before breaking down what he means by correct aqidah, let's just summarize his points, okay? Because you heard what he said about, oh, they don't, uh, they extrapolate from this that, you know, uh, this is the correct aqidah. No, we don't. We don't extrapolate anything from this. We just say that you set the criteria. You set the benchmark that the only time Allah gives us victory is if you have the correct aqidah. Now we're going to break correct aqidah in, in just a second. Now before I respond to him and before we get to the whole evidences, I just want to break down what he means by correct aqidah. Okay, what he means by correct aqidah. What he basically means, what these super Salafis, these uh, zombies, what they actually mean is, what's your position on Allah's names and attributes? Now, I am an Athari who affirms Allah's names and attributes. I don't go around and saying the correct Aqidah is what's your position on Allah's names and attributes because that's part of Aqidah. It's not Aqidah in its totality. That's just a part of Aqidah. Okay? So when you say correct Aqidah, your whole approach and this question is skewed to begin with. Because when you say correct Aqidah, that's all you mean. What's your position on Allah's names and attributes? Now, Aqidah is comprehensive, mate. So let's give you an example. Qadr wal Qadr. That's part of Aqidah. So the correct Aqidah, if you're going to make the claim regarding correct Aqidah, you need to obviously ask about that as well. So that's not part of the equation, is it, for you super Salafis? Allah's names and attributes. So when you say correct Aqidah, that's all you mean. You just mean Allah's names and attributes. Let's carry on. Uh, having the belief of the punishment in the grave. That's part of Aqidah as well. So you could... Carry on your manhaj and aqidah test, but when you say correct aqidah, you never ask anyone about this. So when you say correct aqidah, mate, make sure the aqidah test that you provide is not <laughs> is not a half baked test. Okay, you gotta ask about everything. Correct aqidah, comprehensive, mate. Let's carry on. You have to believe in Jannah one nar. Okay, you have to believe in Jannah one nar. Okay, so do you interrogate or is this not part of the correct aqidah test? No, it's not. So again, like I'm gonna keep mentioning the same thing. It's only Allah's names and attributes, which is important. And as an Athari, I say that, that the Ashara are not part of the Manhaj al-Salaf in this regard. I can say that. But I'm not going to go start labeling every person al-Bidah, every Ash'ari al-Bidah. And don't worry, what, what did Ibn Taymiyyah say about the Ashara in terms of the approach? Don't worry, we're going to shock you today. We're going to really shake your boots today. Let's carry on. Having the belief of the resurrection. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will resurrect us uh, after death, meaning um, it, it, well, some say al aqud some say in, in Arafah. Again, that's, that's you know, one of the uh, ongoing discussions as to where it will be. But that's part of Aqidah as well. You know, the six articles of faith is part of Aqidah. So correct Aqidah is comprehensive. So to my brothers and sisters, when you hear Super Salaf or Madkhali say they don't have the correct Aqidah, just, get it, just put it in your head. All they mean is uh, Asma wa Sifat. So it's hypocritical because Aqidah is comprehensive. So why have you just restricted correct Aqidah to Allah's names and attributes? So this is just a, a disclaimer to a certain extent. So this was his particular point. Now remember this, Dawaman. You set the criteria of 
victory, not us. We didn't say, again, it's, it, it's a true statement, but what you want from it is false. Of course you have to have to, the correct aqidah. But we say, al sunnah wal jama'ah, don't worry, we'll get to what Ibn Taymiyyah, we'll get to other scholars as well. Correct aqidah, when we say al sunnah wal jama'ah, we have set beliefs that separate us from al bidah We've got set beliefs. Now, Salahuddin al-Ayyubi, rahmatullah alayhi, was not just an Ash'ari, where you could say he, is, or he was just a, a, a simple Ash'ari. He propagated the Ash'ari creed. He propagated it in Syria and Egypt. Now, you make a distinction between the layman from the Ash'ari and those who are the callers to it. Now, you guys have double standards. You guys have double standards. Because with your ferocious approach and with your intolerant approach, when it comes to Allah's names and attributes, okay, that an army that obviously an Ash'ari calls himself an Ash'ari, again, I disagree with them when it, with, to their approach of Allah's names and attributes. Get that out there. I'm not agreeing with them in any way, shape or form. But your aggressiveness and your hypocrisy is plain to see or clear to see. Because now, Salahuddin al-Ayyubi was not just an average Ash'ari. He was a fanatical Ash'ari who was solely responsible for spreading the Ash'ari creed in Egypt and Syria. Don't take my word for it, as you can see on screen. We've got Seer al alam al -Ubala. Now the tahqiq of, of this book was done by Shu'aib al-Aranut. Shu'aib al-Aranut. Okay, so the introduction, this is volume one. Okay, because you guys don't read the books. You guys don't read books. Honestly, you cherry pick. You just cherry pick your course and when you do have books, it's just basically miss out and we'll show you later. He conveniently, you know, uh, remembers the hadith which I had to remind him of. But anyway, so the volume one. Now he's talking about Imam al-Dahbi, rahmatullah alayhi. He's talking about Imam al-Dahbi, rahmatullah alayhi. Now Shu'ayb al-Aranut, okay, is the muhaqqiq of this book. Is the one that did the tahqiq of this book. And he's writing an introduction of the um, life of Imam al-Dahbi, rahmatullah alayhi. And look what he says here. He says, وَكَانَ الْأُيُوبِيُونَ قَبْلَ ذَلِكَ he said that the Ayyubiyun was the one that supported or aided, uh, uh, put major effort in, in spreading the Madhab of Imam al-Shafi'i. Remember that, because they were the empire that took over Syria and Egypt. Listen to this as well. And he said, فَأَسَّسُوا الْمَدَارِسَ الْخَاصَ بِهِ And they basically set a foundation of schools, okay, exclusively for it. And he says, as the arrow is over, okay, he says, وَعُونُ فِي وَقْتِ نَفْسِهِ بِنَشْرٍ عَقِيدَةَ الْأَشَرِيَّةِ At the same time, they aided or helped or supported in spreading the madhab or the aqidah of the Ash'ari. And what else does he say? And they considered it sunnah, okay? which they made it obligatory for the people to follow, okay? The Ayyubiyun, okay? And at the head of it is Salahuddin al-Ayyubi. And he said, وَلِذَلِكْ This is Shu'ayb al-Aranut. Not just no, the bro Hajiyan saying this, this is Shu'ayb al-Aranut, rahmatullah alayhi. He says, لِذَلِكْ أَصْبَحَدْ لِأَشْعَرِيَّةِ قُوَّةٌ عَذِيمَةٌ فِي مِصْرِ وَالشَّامِ And because of this, it became a power a major power in Egypt and Syria. And as you can see at the bottom, okay, this is Shu'ayb al-Aranut in the footnotes. Look what he says. And as you can see where he says number three, uh, where he says, um, yajibu that they made it obligatory for the people to follow. Made it obligatory for the people to follow. Number three, what does Shu'ayb al-Aranut say? He says, وَكَانَ السَّلَاحُ الدِّينَ أَشَرِيعًا مُتَعَصِّبًا كَمَا هُوَ مَعْرُوفٌ مِنْ سِيرَتِهِ He says that Salahuddin al-Ayyubi was a fanatical Ash'ari, fanatical. And it is well known from his biography. Okay, now coming back to me now. Okay, coming back to me. Salahuddin al-Ayyubi wasn't just a fanatical Ash'ari, okay? As it's known by Sira. Don't worry, we're going to get to other books as well. Was not the one that was just fanatical. He was largely responsible for laying the foundation for the Ash'ari creed to be spread in Egypt and in Syria, where he conquered. And we'll get to Ibn Qudama later, don't worry about it, we're going to cover everything. And he made it obligatory for the people to follow. Okay, that's what you call fanatical. So now, I like to ask you, why do you make every excuse under the sun for Salahuddin al-Ayyubi? Okay, 
I see this as, I see double standards, not just double, triple standards at its finest. Because if you had an Ash'ari today, let's put it this way, let's present some facts, hard facts to you. If there was an equivalent, because Alhamdulillah, you know, Salah al-Din al-Yubi was unique, and we pray that Allah sends us another Salah al-Din rahmatullah alayhi. But just say, we had an equivalent, okay? Not like him, but an equivalent. And he was spreading the Ash'ari creed. And he was making it obligatory for the people to follow in the lands that, just say, in one of the uh, areas of the Muslim world. And he was building Madaris, we're going to get to that later. And he made it, as I said, just said, uh, made it obligatory for people to follow. And because of this influence, the Ash'ara creed became a major power in Egypt and Syria. You will label that person an innovator without fail. Both you, Super Salafis and the Madakhila, without hesitation. So now, <laughs> I ask you, why the double and triple standards when it comes to Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi rahmatullahi Why? Why the double standards? Now to tie this in even further, we're going to go to a contemporary work. Okay? Because this is ma'roof min siratihi. This is known. You could go to Nawad al-Sultaniyya, you could go to Kami fit tarikh because Ibn Athi was in his army. You could go to most of the books that write about his biography. He was a fanat- fanatical Ash'ari. We got the uh, book Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi rahmatullahi As you can see on screen, this is from uh, Dr. Ali Muhammad. Uh, Muhammad al Salabi, okay, this is uh, obviously he ain't gonna be uh, well liked for the super Salafis, but again, you could check the references because you guys don't read about Salah al Ayyubi, you got no attachment to him, it's just mere words, lip service, like I said last time. So, again, Shu'ayb al Aranud confirms it and he says, This is known about his position, as you can see, it states that he had a good aqidah, okay, and he used to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah, and basically, he states. Uh, the Aqidah of his state was Ali Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Again, we also confirm who has said that uh, the Ash'ara, generally speaking, are part of Ali Sunnah wal Jama'ah. You could disagree with me on that, but you can't force it down our throats. Uh, that he, he had the Aqidah of Ali Sunnah wal Jama'ah in his totality. You get it? In Asma wa Sifat, yes, in terms of Allah's names and attributes, we can say, again, as an Athari, I could say, I disagree with, uh, what's it called, Salahuddin al Ayyubi rahmatullah alayhi on this. No problem. No problem. So again, as it's obviously been laid down by the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Khulafai Rashidin or Khulafai Rashidun. Again, remember, Aqeedah of Ali Sunnah Wal Jama'ah, we mean Aqeedah in its totality. Don't fall for the traps of the Super Salafis when they say, correct Aqeedah, all they are uh, referring to is al Asma Wa Sifat, which is a part of Aqeedah, which is very important. But once again, just because Obviously, they don't agree with us on this. Khalas al bidah they don't have the correct aqidah and ignore all the other aspects of aqidah. Do you understand what I mean? And we'll compare it to the other al bidah later on when we get to the other books as well. Then he says, وَإِسْتَمَرَ الْأَيُوبِيُّونَ بَعْدَ وَفَاتْ صَلَاحُ الدِّينَ عَلَى هَذِهِ الْعَقِيدَةِ Okay? And he also says that Salah al-Din used to um, honor the, uh, the symbols of Allah Azza wa Jalla, the symbols of the deen. And he used to hate the philosophers and the ones that uh, negate uh, the Allah's names and attributes, and he used to aid the religion, etc. Now, listen to this. Coming back to me now. Salahuddin Ayyubi is an Ash'ari. I'm trying to educate the super Salafis today because look, Salahuddin Ayyubi was a fanatical Ash'ari, but he used to hate the philosophers. He used to hate them. And he used to hate the Mu'attila, okay, the one that used to like, you know, kind of negate Allah's names and attributes. And he used to aid the Sharia. Now, this is what we're trying to say to you super Salafis. There's nuances. Your programming doesn't allow you to think critically or to think outside the box. You just been brainwashed and it's sad. It is absolutely sad. So Salahuddin Ayyubi Rahmatullahi is a fanatical Ashari. Now, just making it summarized before we get to the quotes. Why isn't he not an innovator? He aided. The reason why Syria and Egypt are Ashari today, and even we get to the other umpires as well, is that he was an Ashari. He spread the Ash'ari creed. So why isn't he not an innovator? Why isn't he not an innovator? I don't get it. Why are you having double standards and triple standards when it comes to Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi, as I mentioned before? If someone did something similar to him today, <laughs> you'd be making PDFs, like a 100-page PDF, and calling him an innovator, and, you know, uh, a Jahmi, or, you know, like your teacher. So let's carry on. He mentions as well that um, Shiddad and Salah al-Din, that he had a good aqidah, uh, he used to remember Allah a lot and he used to take his creed, okay, with evidences uh, from research from his scholars, okay, with knowledge. Um, oh, those are people of knowledge and the major fuqaha. And his creed was basically free from tashbih. Now, this is what they mean when they say 
he obviously um, he was an Ash'ari, basically those who affirm Allah's name's attributes, he wasn't the one that used to do that, okay? He, never, he wasn't the one that used to do that. Uh, so, let's carry on. He also mentions, okay, we're going into the book. You can see we're making it clear. He says, Rabi'an, Usul al Sunniyah. That his foundational creed, you know, which is uh, Sunniyah. He says that the importance of the Ayyubiyun. Now remember, because of him, the whole empire was Ashari. The whole empire. Carry on. Uh, he preserved the uh, the Ubiyun, sorry, with Salah Hadin al Ubiyun continued, uh, uh, included, sorry, that the, uh, they preserved the Asul of the Aqeedah upon the Madhab of Imam al Ash'ari. Okay? And he said that uh, Salah Hadin Rahmatullah was the one who was from the ulama who carried this banner of knowledge uh, in all facets of his religion. Okay? In all facets of religion. So here we got Salah Hadin by uh, Dr. Al Salabi. Okay? Now Salah Hadin al Ubi, what. Um, means did he use to propagate the Ash'ari creed in the lands that he ruled? Because remember, the uh, Zengid Empire was also Ash'ari, by the way. Okay, and they were granted many victories. But we're going to get to a story just to show you, all right, then uh, how, if he's got a deviation in Aqeedah, correct Aqeedah, which is just, again, when you say that, you're just restricting it to Allah's names and attributes. Um, what did he do? What did Salah did, uh, do or, or, or uh, implement in order to get the Ash'ari creed propagated? He built many madaris. For example, he built Al, -al, -al Madrasa Al Salihiya. He built that. He built Al Dar Al Hadith Al Kamiliya. He built Al Madrasa Al Husayniya in Qahira. So you know the uh, the mosque in Al Qahira. He built it. He also built Al, -al, -al Madrasa Al Fadiliya. So he built many many uh, madrasas in order to propagate uh, the Ash'ari creed. Why is he not an innovator? Why isn't Salahuddin Al Ayyubi Rahmatullah Alayhi an innovator? Because one, he's not, the, uh, he's not a layman, he was a student of knowledge, you could even call him a scholar. If Salah al-Din al -Yubi, rahmatullah was alive today, he'd be classified as a scholar. So, why is he not an innovator? He propagated the uh, Ash'ari creed. He propagated it. The reason why Syria and Egypt are Ash'ari today is largely thanks uh, to his efforts. And again, for me, I disagree uh, with the Ash'ari creed. That's just my position as an Athari. But I'm not going to be, uh, you know, vocal in, in calling them innovators, etc. And again, you might say, oh, Ibn Qudama. Don't worry, we're going to get to that. Okay, now what we're going to do now is play Da'wan. We're going to get to Shamsi after this. We're going to still go resort back to uh, Da'wan as well. That now you'll find his contradiction. Because remember he said uh, they use history. Listen to him. So a lot of people usually do that. They bring verses that have an ambiguous meaning. Here, when people bring the story of Salahuddin Al Yubi, they're not even bringing, bringing an ambi, ambi, they're not even bringing an ambiguous verse. Rather, what they're bringing is an ambiguous in, uh, incident in history. That's the first point. That if you at least brought an ambiguous verse, which at least you brought a delete, you haven't even brought a delete. That's the first point. You really have to understand that you did not even bring a delete. The second point is that we have a man called Umar ibn Khattab, who I've mentioned before, actually conquered. He actually conquered Mecca. Sorry, he actually conquered Jerusalem. And when he conquered Jerusalem, he was, you know, not looking very appealing. And Abu Ubaidah radiallahu ta'ala anhu saw him coming with his camel, walking on his own two feet, even with his shoes on, holding the camel like a slave. Uh, and he came out to him and he said to him, Oh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, look at the way you, you know, you are. The people may not respect you. Uh, you know, you're about to govern them. And, you know, they had Romans that were governing them. People, they, they know, they see their leaders to be, you know, dressed in a certain type of way. And he was concerned about his outer appearance and he was worried that the people will not be receiving him as the Khalifa in a positive way. So Umar radiallahu and then the conqueror, with the last permission of uh, uh, the one who opened, um, uh, his army opened. Uh, the, the, the Jerusalem, uh, he looked at Abu Ubaidah and he said, لو يقول ذا غيرك أبا عبيدة جعلت نكالا لأمة محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم He said, Abu Ubaidah, had anyone else other than you said that I would have punished him and made an example out of him for the Ummah of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم And then he said, إنا كنا أذل قوم We were a humiliated people فعزنا الله بالإسلام And Allah عز و جل, he honored us and he gave us victory through Islam So pay attention, Islam here is talking about the correct, pure version of Islam, the Islam of the Prophet Ali the Islam of the companions, uh, because that's the Islam that he knew, radiallahu ta'ala, he didn't know the Ash'ali Islam, or the Matulidi Islam, or the Islam of the Jahmiyyah, he knew the Islam of the Prophet Ali Islam, so, and there can only be one correct Islam, right? Either the Ash'ali Islam is right, or the Umar Islam is right, and we know the Umar, without a shadow of doubt, was not an Ash'ali, because the Ashari didn't exist until uh, uh, the third century, plus, 
Does that make sense? No, no, makes your ears bleed, doesn't he? Listen to that, honestly, on my ears, I'm bleeding. Honestly, this is just painful. One is my eardrums, obviously. I felt like they were just gonna pop at any time. Listen to that absolute garbage. So let's just break his points down. Number one is saying that we didn't bring uh, uh, any verses. Obviously, we brought an event in history. And he, he, he's obviously, if you watch the video, he talks about the verse that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that Allah sent down verses that are, uh, you know, clear. And there are verses that are ambiguous. And those who have like a sickness in their heart goes to the verses that are unclear, etc, etc. And, all, and you, if you go into it, you watch it. Um, what he does straight after is shocking because what he does is that he goes to a historical event. So the same thing you're accusing us of, you do it yourself. So a lot of people usually do that. They bring verses that have an ambiguous meaning. Here, when people bring the story of Salahuddin Ali, they're not even bringing, bringing an ambi, ambi, they're not even bringing an ambiguous verse. Rather, what they're bringing is an ambiguous in, uh, incident in history. That's the first point. That if you at least brought an ambiguous verse, which at least you brought a delil. You haven't even brought a delil. That's the first point. You really have to understand that you did not even bring a delil. The second point is that we have a man called Umar ibn Khattab ta'ala who I've mentioned before actually conquered he actually conquered Mecca sorry he actually conquered Jerusalem and when he conquered Jerusalem he was you know not looking very appealing and Abu Ubaidah ta'ala who saw him coming with his camel walking on his own two feet even with his shoes on holding the camel like a slave uh, and he came out to him and he said to him oh Amir al-Mu'mineen look at the way you you know you are the people may not respect you uh, you know, you're about to govern them. And, you know, they had Romans that were governing them. So he talks about, we obviously didn't bring a verse, you didn't bring a delete. And then he goes on and then <laughs> carries on and narrates an historical event and uses it as proof for him. Honestly, you can't even write this in a, in a Disney Pixar movie. So the same thing you're accusing me of, you did yourself. You just narrated an historical event. What happened in Jabal Mukabbir. Except I've been to Palestine three times. I've been on that mountain, mate. You understand? Have you? So don't talk about this story, mate. I've been to Palestine three times, mate. So I know, and I've been to the church of the Holy Sepulchre. I've been inside when Umar ibn Khattab met the patriarch uh, or the bishop. And I prayed in Masjid Umar ibn Khattab when he went outside. Of, and we know the story, mate. So the point I'm trying to get to is that you just did the exact same um, deed that you accused me of. Or, you know, us of, should I say. And what really was shocking, he said that when Umar ibn Khattab says, نحن um, قوماً uh, so we were a nation that was honored with Islam and if we seek honor uh, to other than Islam uh, Allah will humiliate us so let's break, break this down and then he, he was well, shocked when he goes Salah, Umar ibn Khattab only know the correct Islam he didn't know the Ash'aris what are you talking about mate? so, so what are you trying to say Salah did not you be one upon the correct Islam? <laughs> because that's what you insinuate that's what you're trying to see this, See how this subtle tip it comes out he goes so Umar ibn Khattab did not uh, know about uh, the Ash'ari Islam. So uh, what you're trying to say is that you guys, you super Salafis are upon the uh, Islam of the Sahaba and we are not. All the Muslims are not upon the, the Islam of the Prophet and the companions, only you guys and your little super Salafi clique. So just to add, okay, when Umar ibn Khattab says, نَحْنُ قَوْمًا عَزَّنَ اللَّهِ بِالْإِسْلَامِ That we are a nation that Allah honored with Islam, he was talking about when they were mushriks. He was talking about when there were a people that were worshipping idols, who were burying their daughters alive. And then Allah honored them with Islam. Of course, the Islam that came from the Prophet they were upon that, no doubt about it. Salah al Ayyubi rahmatullah alayhi, what was he upon then? Was he upon the Islam of the Jahmiyyah? Was he upon, okay, you could say the Ashara, but the Ashara are from the general framework of al Sunnah wal-Jama'ah. So were they following other than Islam? It's absolutely shocking. So the point here is, that you need to really contemplate and sincerely think before you open your mouth. So the same thing you accused me of, you did yourself. You narrated a historical event. And then you said, Amr ibn Khattab only knew the correct Islam. He did not know the Ash'ari Islam. For you to just make that statement shows the level of ignorance that you have. That, that, that example or using that as a proof, it's shocking, honestly. And I, I sincerely believe, listen mate, don't come on camera. You're only embarrassing yourself. And there can only be one correct Islam, right? If the Ash'ari Islam is right or the Umar Islam is right. And we know the Umar without a shadow of doubt was not an Ash'ari because the Ash'ari didn't exist until uh, uh, the third century plus. Does that make sense? Either the Ash'ari Islam is right or either the Umari Islam is right. Why are you going on about it, mate? What kind of nonsense is this? 
<laughs> Honestly, it's so ridiculous that there is no way I could even respond to this. The Ashari Islam is right or the Umari Islam is right. Like, who invented this term, the Umari Islam? Have we got a term called Abu Bakri Islam, Uthmani Islam, Ali Alawi Islam, like uh, Khalid bin Walidi Islam? Like, where are you getting this rubbish from? It, you see how they just make up stuff as they go along. And they are the worst when they come to spreading doubts. When they accuse their opponents of Shubha, they are the number one proponents of spreading doubts. Now we're going to move on to Shamsi, okay? Now we're going to move on to Shamsi. I'm just, again, highlighting the reoccurring theme that they are no different. They could be fighting with each other, pulling their hair out, you know, scratching themselves uh, when they meet each other. In essence, I don't even know why, because you guys are exactly the same. Let's listen to Shamsi. Some people say Saadin Ayyub is Ash'ari. Okay, Saadin Ayyubi was Ash'ari, Ash'ari is a different sect. However, Saadi Ayyubi lived at a time when Ash'ariya was spread in an area. No one knows what is the, 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 the correct belief of Ahl Sunnah and Jama'ah. Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi lived in a time where people didn't know the correct belief of Ahl Sunnah and Jama'ah. Listen to that again. Some people say Saadin Ayyubi was Ash'ari. Okay, Saadi Ayyubi was Ash'ari, Ash'ari is a different sect. However, Saadi Ayyubi lived at a time when Ash'ariya was spread in an area. No one knows what is the, 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 the correct belief of Ahl Sunnah al-Jama'ah. <laughs> Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi lived in an area when the, the, where the people didn't know what the correct belief of Ahl Sunnah al-Jama'ah. Listen, Jamzi, Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi was a fanatical Ash'ari, mate. He is the one that spread it. Ash'ariya or the Ash'ari, again, I'm not an Ash'ari, but the Ash'aris need to thank Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi. Because because of him and his dynasty, that's how Ash'ariya spread. So for you to say, uh, Salah <laughs> <laughs> His own teacher Nuruddin was an Ash'ari. We'll get to Nuruddin later. Rahmatullah alayhi. So, Salah Adin lived in an area or a time when <laughs> not many people knew the correct belief of Ali's in the world. Look how he's belittling the people of that time. Like, they were so ignorant that they didn't know. Little did this uh, Barkin Madkhali know that Salah Adin al Ayyubi was solely responsible for spreading the Ash'ari creed. So, I'll ask you now why isn't he an uh, innovator? Why? Because you're the one, when you had a discussion uh, with Brother Higab, you said that we make a distinction between the layman and the callers to bid'ah. Salah al-Din al-Yubi built madaris, installed judges, installed shuyuk, installed fuqaha to promote the Ash'ari creed. And he was the one that was, the one that supported the Ash'ari creed. Okay, so why is he an innovator? Let's carry on. However, he, he was ruling by Quran and Sunnah, also, he was raising the people up with the Quran and the Sunnah. Look at the excuses that are popping in now. <laughs> Look at the excuses that are popping in for Salah al-Din al uh, he, was, he, he ruled by Quran and Sunnah. Uh, and he, you know, he was nurturing the people on the Quran and Sunnah. Look how, honestly, do you make any excuses for the Ash'ari of today like this? Because you know, if you were to say, you know you want to call Salah al-Din al an Ash'ari, uh, an innovator. I want to call Salah al-Din al rahmatullah an innovator. Trust me, your son is trying so hard and you could tell this is unnatural. Uh, he he uh, spread in a time where uh, Ash'ari, not many people knew what the correct belief was. And he was ruled by Quran and the Sunnah and he was nurtured. So just saying Ash'ari yeah, of today was doing the exact same thing as Salah al-Din al rahmatullah. Would you give him the same excuses? No, you wouldn't, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Let's carry on. Doesn't mean because he fell into some mistakes. Khalas. When we say let us go back to Quran and Sunnah, doesn't mean we have to be perfect. Yeah. No. You know? Doesn't mean that. You understand? I beg your pardon? Just because he fell into a few mistakes, I wouldn't call a few mistakes uh, being a fanatical Ash'ari and uh, building Madaris and strengthening the Ash'ari creed and being largely responsible for spreading it in in uh, Syria and Egypt. I wouldn't call that a few mistakes, mate, a few mistakes. And your articles or your, your particular group, I have a read of this. Basically, they were criticizing, okay, Adar Qutni, and I'm gonna do a video on this as well, going into the proofs, etc. They criticized Adar Qutni for a single kiss, a single word of praise, a single moment in time, how the Ash'ari faith entered North Africa. And you guys wrote a whole article about this. I'm going to do a video on that uh, soon. So 
you guys made a big deal about this by saying, you know, because Imam Darqutni killed Imam Bak, uh, kissed Imam Al Bakliani, uh, and then uh, what's he called? One of the scholars there, I think is uh, I think Al Hawari, Al Hawari. I can't remember his name. We'll go into the video. And when he saw this, he asked him again. Well, I don't want to go into it, but this is how the Ash he went back to Mecca. A lot of scholars came from North Africa, and he taught the uh, the Ash'ari creed because uh, of what he saw his teacher at Dar Qutni do. So if you're gonna, if this was a major problem for you, then why are you making excuses for Salah Al-Din al Ayyubi Rahmatullah by saying, uh, you know what, uh, he was ruling by the Quran and the Sunnah, and he made a few mistakes, and then he said, when you go, what do you say about the Quran and the Sunnah? You don't need to be perfect. Let's listen to that again. Doesn't mean because he fell into some mistakes, khalas. When we say let's go back to Quran and Sunnah, doesn't mean we have to be perfect. No. You know, doesn't mean that, you understand? So when we go back to the Quran and Sunnah, we don't have to be perfect. Okay, that's fine. So the Ash'ari, okay, uh, the, the normal army from the Ash'ara, or generally the Ash'ari, they don't have to be perfect. Okay, again, we disagree with the Ash'ari. I, again, I'm, I'm with you on this, you know. I know it's hurting me to say this, but it's true. We are Ash'ari, so we don't agree with the Ash'ara on this. Uh, but they don't have to be perfect. So they make excuses for them the way you're making excuses for Salah al-Din al So you don't. So you just, you're just, you, 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 uh, your taqiyya switch is on, and I think it's on for a very long time uh, during the speaker's corner conversation. So going back to what we were saying is that you're itching, you're dying to call Salah al-Din a uh, UN innovator, but you know the backlash you get from it. So you're very good in how you mask it. You're very good in how you conceal it. So both of you, Shamsi and Dawman, you are falling right on your face and your double and your double standards are being exposed and it's not even double it's triple you can say even quadruple the way you guys are making excuses and i look into the camera and say this why isn't salah al-din an innovator why all right you can say he made he made a mis few mistakes in tawid he didn't make a few mistakes according to your book okay because you would label people innovators for just what for, for the mere for the mere Positions that Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi uh, holds, okay, and even the Shuyukh around it, you will label them as innovators. If they were alive today, you will label them innovators. So why are you making excuses? Because you know Salah al-Din's achievements are known, and he is a hero, he's a battle. Um, the soldiers that were with him, may Allah have mercy upon them and accept them as martyrs, those who uh, strived to, to liberate Bayt al Maqdis from the Solibiyin, from the Crusaders. Now, what we'll do, okay, we've got, a, we got another a story which I think, don't think these voice papers know about. Uh, and I'm gonna educate you today, like I always do. If you listen, because you don't listen, you, you avoid my videos like the play, don't you? Don't listen, don't listen to bro Haji, don't listen. Because you know, if you start listening, you'll think, oh, you know what, Haji's got a point. So, because you're so brainwashed, you wouldn't even untie. Look, let, let me show you the difference between me and uh, my opponents, okay, my interlocutors. I'm telling my followers now and my viewers who aren't even my uh, subscribers go watch Shanti and Dalma, go watch their videos. Go watch them. I'm, I'm, I'm being honest and sincere to all of you. Go watch their videos and then compare it to my videos, okay? So, watch their videos, then watch mine. And you'll see the difference between the two. Because I'm not distorting anything. I'm not hiding anything. You understand? Whereas they don't put nothing on screen. Okay? And I got, uh, I got a, a little message at the end as well to a certain someone who I'm going to respond to. So, Nuruddin Zinki. Now, history lesson. Okay? Because it's all about history. Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi rahmatullah was born in Tikrit. Okay? In the Ambar province of Al-Iraq. At that particular time, the Zengid dynasty was in control. The Zengid dynasty were Turks, okay, that ruled Iraq and parts of Syria, okay. And it was the father of Nuruddin Zinki. He was the uh, Amir of Mosul, okay. So his capital, his Asima, was in, in Mosul. He was the one that started the after the first crusade. So when they went in and slaughtered Nehi to the horses, the Seljuk Empire were in power. We're gonna get when we respond to the next person. Uh, the the I don't know. I will mention it at the end. Uh, we're gonna go into all of this in depth to show them that this person across the pond and all of these super Salafis, absolute crazy, crazy, or well, not sincere as well. So Imad al Din. Uh, Zenki, who was the father of Nuruddin Zenki, got uh, martyred and Nuruddin Zenki took control. Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi was a Kurd, okay, for those who don't know, Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi was from a Kurdish family um, from Iraq, meaning in, um, 
and from Tikrit, Tikrit, and then uh, from the story, his uh, father. Again, we don't want to go into it about uh, uh, what what he did. I think there was a woman that accused a certain um, soldier of, of rape, and then he took her honor, and that was the day Salah al-Din al-Yubi rahmatullahi was born. They migrated to the um, where did they go to? They went to somewhere. I forgot where they went. So they migrated. And Salah al-Din then joined the army of uh, Nuruddin Zinki, and he was under his control. And his uncle Shirokh went to Misr, destroyed the Fatim Yun. Don't want to get to that, let's fast track. So Nuruddin Zinki was a righteous ruler, righteous. Nuruddin Zinki, the son of Imad al-Din. And he was the uh, teacher of Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi uh, He was the one as well, so just to fast track, when they built, uh, when, when he was obviously fighting the Crusaders, uh, Another point, he's Ash'ari, <laughs> okay, <laughs> he was Ash'ari. Uh, so he built a, a member, okay, uh, a member. I've got it there, I should show you, shouldn't I? Uh, well, I don't think the camera will be able to zoom into it. Uh, I'm on my own, I do everything on my own, by the way. So uh, he built the member, passed away before he could conquer Baytul Maqdis. But he was the one that carried on the, his father's work uh, and jihad against the Crusaders. So what happened was uh, when Salah al Ayyubi finally conquered Baytul Maqdis, okay, uh, the member that was uh, was made was made by his teacher, and Salah al Ayyubi Rahmatullah put that member, and the first khutbah was done on the Jum'ah when he conquered it. And some say he, obviously it was the same day as the Isra wal Mi'raj, the 27th Rajab. But let's move on, Sam. Uh, Nuruddin Zengi was a righteous king, and there's a, there's a very, very famous story. Nuruddin Zengi was an Ash'ari, and there's a famous story regarding a dream he had, okay? And uh, for those who, who have learnt, Will know what I'm talking about. So let's relate this story. It's very lengthy, so I'm going to summarize it, but I'm going to get to the main points. As you can see on screen, at the book, Wafa'a al Wafa. To sort of summarize, okay, let's just get to the main story. It mentions that Nuruddin Zinki, okay, was a just uh, Sultan, okay, uh, Shaheed as well. Farah Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fi nawmihi, wa huwa yashir ila rajulain, ashqarain, wa yakul, anjidni, anqidni. He said that basically Salah uh, Nuruddin Zenki uh, prayed the Hajjul Salat and sleep overtook him. Okay, and when sleep overtook him, he saw the Messenger of Allah or the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in his dream, and he pointed towards these two blonde men, and he said, "Save me, save me, okay, from these two min hadain. Save me, save me from these two, okay." So what happened? Nuruddin uh, Zenki woke up panicking. Fazian, he woke up panicking. So what happened? ثم توضى وصلى ونام فراء المنام بعينه. So what happened was he got up, he was panicking. He made wudu. Look at the just ruler, Ash'ari. He got up, he made wudu, he prayed, he slept, and saw the same dream again. That the Prophet ﷺ came, showed him two blonde men, and said, "Save me, save me from these two." Okay. Then he got up again. Okay. وصلى ونام. فراه أيضا مرة ثالث. That he woke up, he prayed, he went to sleep again, and he saw the same dream again for the third time. Okay. So, long story short, basically they told him, look, go to Medina. They go. This means something. Go to the Prophet's mosque, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now, Nur al-Din was in Damascus. He was in Syria. So he took sadaqa with him. Okay, look at the wisdom of Nuruddin Zenki. I'm just showing you, okay? So Nuruddin Zenki saw the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa in his dream. Ash'ari, deviant, innovator. According to uh, Abd al-Rahman Hassan, your teacher, they are like the Jahmiya. They believe in uh, the Quran being created. All of these things that, you know, he's popped out the hat. Don't worry, train wreck part two is coming as well. I'm, I'm going to be a busy bee in the next couple of weeks. Uh, so basically, they went to Medina, okay? He took a, a, few, a few of his soldiers and he went to the Prophet's mosque, okay? So he brought some sadaqah, okay? So he, when he brought some sadaqah, as you can see, he basically asked, okay, is there anyone else that needs this sadaqah? Okay, he asked the people. So he basically gave sadaqah. And remember, he already knows what these two people look like because they're two blonde men, okay? Two blondies. <laughs> Sakrullah, shouldn't say that. Two blonde men. So, so Sultan, so basically he gave the Sadaqah. Okay, so to, to, to cut a long story short, he gave the Sadaqah and he said, Hal baqa ahad lam ya'khud shay'an min al Sadaqah. He said, Is there anyone that is remaining that hasn't taken from this Sadaqah? Qalu la. The people of Medina said, No, no one has. Fakala, so they, so Salah uh, so Nuruddin Zenki said, 
Tafakkaru wa ta'ammalu. He says, look, think and ponder. Is there anyone else that hasn't took it? So they said, Lam yabiq. Ahad illa rajulain maghribiyain. That they were, they, oh, there's no one else apart from these two men from the West. Okay? They haven't taken from anything. These two men from the West. So now Nur al-Din Zeki is getting curious. Okay? Um, but they are two righteous rich men. Okay? Who give in Sadaqah a lot. Okay? They give in Sadaqah a lot. So, they, they came, those two men came, and he saw them. And they were exactly as the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam described them to be: to Nuruddin Zenki, an Ashari, a person of deviates, a person who's not upon the Quran and the Sunnah, a person that would be classed as an innovator. Yet the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam came. Again, I'm not using this as a hukum shari. Just don't get me wrong. But I'm saying, look who Allah favored to save the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Okay, carry on. So he knew who they were. Long story short, he found out their plot, he uncovered their plot, and when he found out who they were, he cried and he executed them. Okay, he executed them. So now, coming back to me. Okay, so you've seen the story. It's lengthy. He obviously goes in, he, he hides, he takes his men with him, he obviously finds them, etc. It's very lengthy. You could go into the book. Now, you notice, my dear brothers and sisters, that they don't research. They don't read. I'm telling you, these, them two don't read. The, uh, the Super Salafi Dao man gets his information from his pay, pay, payroll script writers. They just regurgitate uh, the Super Salafi rhetoric. And the other one gets it from uh, those at Right Street. They don't read. I guarantee they didn't even know about this story. And if they did know about it, they didn't even know where the book was. Why? Because you've got to find, you've got to read, you've got to research, you've got to listen to the ulama, not just, you know, your three, four ulama that you've restricted knowledge to. No, not at all. So, let's go back to what I was saying, because it's all the theme about innovators, about al-bida. Nuruddin Zenki was honoured by seeing the Prophet wasallam in his dream. Allah honoured him. So, he's from al-bida, according to you. Would Allah honour a person from al-bida to... Rescued the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and to add, sorry, I forgot, flip my mind. As you can see on screen, what Nur, uh, what Nuruddin Zenki did was, after executing these two near the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's hujra or the uh, the hujra of Aisha, what he did was he st he ordered that they they pour a lot of lead around the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam's grave. Okay, so he dug and they poured lead, okay, uh, around the hujra uh, of the the western side, uh, and and a wall. Uh, full of lead and they poured water over it, etc. etc. Okay, etc. etc. So you see the honor. Look at that. Subhanallah. So now the question I'd like to ask again was Nuruddin Zenki an innovator? According to your books, he would be, wouldn't he? So Allah honored an innovator to see the Prophet in his dream because he ain't got the correct aqidah. So, how did he see the Prophet in his dream? And number two is, how did he even rescue the Prophet? Okay, Allah honored him with that. Deviant, isn't it? Deviant, deviant. And if you use uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we'll get to that later. Uh, we'll get to that later. <laughs> Don't worry, we're fast tracking. Okay, now what we're going to do is listen to Da'a man. Have a listen. So this is, a, a, so, so now we've got a person saying that, look, Salahuddin Ayyubi, rahimahullah ta'ala, uh, he had victory regardless, he was, uh, despite him being an Ash'ari. And then, but the thing is, if you're going to use historical incidences, why pick Salahuddin over Umar? Now, just to add, I'm not picking Salahuddin over Umar. Why? What a, what a ridiculous comparison. No one's picking no one. You set the criteria. You set the benchmark. You made this your foundational argument that victory can only come if you have the correct aqidah. Basically, Bayn al Qawsain, you know, in brackets, what your position is in the Asma wa Sifat. They've made correct aqidah Asma wa Sifat. And al asma wa sifat. Everything else is irrelevant. Believing in Adab al Qabr, Qadar, Jannah wa Nar, resurrection, all of that is irrelevant. Correct aqidah if you affirm Allah's names and attributes. So, no one's picking no one. We narrate the story of Umar al Khattab when he conquered Baytul Maqdis, and we also narrate the story of Salah al Ayyubi when he liberated Baytul Maqdis. No one's picking no one. It's you that's picking. 
Because, like I said, you really, really want to deep down your burning. You want to call Salahuddin al Ayyubi rahmatullahi uh, uh, innovator and Nuruddin Zinki. And let me, uh, but I'm going to uh, respond to the other guy uh, soon. I'm going to do I'm trying to, I'm going to block off their, their potential technicality that they're going to throw. Okay. Uh, so, you know me, I'm one step ahead of them. As you can see in my hand, I've got Sahil Bukhari. Sahil Bukhari. So, cut a long story short. Okay. This is hadith number 4203. Okay. 4203. And basically, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Inna Allah yu ayidu dina bi rajlin fajir." That Allah can aid His religion through a transgressive person. Okay, Allah can aid His religion through a transgressive person. So as you can see, it's Sahih Bukhari. Okay. So now I like to ask you. Okay, would you really want to class Salahuddin al Ayyubi rahmatullahi alayhi as a fajir? <laughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can aid his religion from a fajr, no problem, I, I agree with you, no one's denying that, I'm just trying to block off any, you know, potential technicality, okay, no problem, Salah al-Din al rahmatullahi okay, to you will be classed as a fajr, you really want to be that brave and say that, <laughs> you know, honestly speaking, Salah al-Din al was a just king, go read the biography of, uh, of Salah al-Din al in uh, Imam al Dahbi, was an athari in Sira al-Alam al did he say, Okay, yeah, Salah al-Din al-Yubi was, was an Ash'ari and he liberated Baytul Maqdis, but you know what? Uh, he didn't have the correct Aqeedah and um, he, as the Prophet says, in Allah, uh, Allah, indeed Allah aids his uh, religion through a transgressive, rebellious person. Now, remember, a Fajir, it's not a, it's not a praiseworthy title. Like if you were to say to any brother, Anta Fajir, right? he's going to end up punching your lights out. That's not a, a, a respectable title. So to, if you're going to use that, I don't believe Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi falls under that because he was a righteous ruler, a righteous sultan, you know, and he wasn't even a caliph. Let's pray out that the Ayyubi Yunus were around at the time, but they were useless, but, you know, just to get that out there. The Saljuks were around, you know, uh, if you know history, you, you know that obviously um, there was a lot going on um, when, when the Crusaders took uh, Baytul Maqdis, the Saljuks were in power. See, the Saljuks were in power. Uh, I think the Fatima you were in power as well, so there was a lot of uh, split. But remember, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says in the Quran, "Wa in al fujara la fi jahim." So Nuruddin Zenki, if you're going to use this, was a fajr. Imad al-Din was a fajr. Uh, al Arsalan was a fajr. Malik Shah was a fajr. Um, Uthman, Orhan, Bayezid, Murad, all of them fujar. Astaghfirullah, they be very wise. The father of Ibn Qudama al Maqdisi, okay. Um, migrated from the areas which were controlled by the Solibiyin. Okay, so the family migrated. Okay, the family migrated. And they settled in an area which was controlled by Salahuddin al Ayyubi rahmatullah alayhi. They settled in that area. The whole family. Okay, so as you can see on screen. So thereafter, he went to Damascus. Cut a long story short, he mentions all the names there. So um, obviously, with the Suhaba of Zawj Ukht, uh, the, um, the husband of his sister, one of the uh, Muqtasis. Uh, obviously was also uh, part of this migration um, and they, they basically landed or arrived at this place called Qa, uh, Qasyun fi makan qafrin fa umuruhu wa sumya bi so basically they settled in this place and they called it Salihiyah okay and wa ghadan hayyan Min Ahammi Ahyad Dimishq. And then later on, it became one of the very, very important areas in Damascus. Okay, so now they've left. Okay, they're settled now in Damascus. And then he said that he, he basically strengthened his family, uh, all of them with the Quran and Hadith and their narrations with the Aqeedah of the Salaf, okay, or Salafiyya, and the Madhab of the Hanbali. Okay, then he says he, he, he participated, okay, meaning the family. In uh, with Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi in liberating Bayt al-Maqdis, okay, in liberating Bayt al-Maqdis, and then a lot of them obviously traveled uh, seeking hadith like Sheikh Ahmed ibn Qudama and his son. So the Ahmed ibn Qudama, okay, was the father of who? He was the father of Ibn Qudama al-Maqdisi, as he says, because Ibn Qudama al-Maqdisi, his name was Muwaffaq, okay, wa Ibn Ukht and the son of his sister Abdul Ghani. And then their family, etc. So, one thing you have to obviously add is this: is that the family of Ibn Qudama migrated from Baytul Maqdis and the surrounding areas to Salihiyya, uh, which is obviously in Damascus. And remember, they've left now. So, we're going to get to the quote of Ibn Qudama, what he said about the Ashaira. Well, no one's denying that. Again, but like I said before, 
any position that an alim holds, okay, if he holds that position, that's what he views them as. No problem. So the, 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 the point I'm trying to raise is he didn't have to participate in the army because one, remember Al Bida, okay, the worst of Al Bida, don't even sit next to them, don't even. So he was in a salihiyah, his family are safe. He knows all about the riwayat of obviously joining Al Bida, sitting with Al Bida, etc., etc. He didn't have to. He was in Salihiyah. He didn't have to join Salahuddin al Ayyubi if he felt as strongly as he did. Or the way you guys, you know, treat Al Bida as basically, you know, because Tabdi for you guys is, is near enough the same as Takfir. I'm not saying you make Takfir, I'm saying the way you treat it is the same way as the Takfir Yun. And we, we have to thank the Dawat and Ashdi for that, for this Takfiri madness. But anyway, so what we're going to do is present the statement of what they use regularly, okay? Because uh, Imam Qudama did have uh, very, very strong views against the uh, Sha'ara. So let's, let's present it. As you can see on screen, we've got the book, okay? Hikayatu al Munadaratu fil Quran ma ba'd al al bidah. That he had uh, the story of the uh, debate or the discussion about the Quran with al bidah. So he said, Wala na'arifu min al bidah. He said, We do not know of al bidah, okay? A group that discloses or withholds their statements, okay? And it says they don't make it apparent. Uh, and those ones that do this, he goes, he doesn't know any group of al bidah that does this, more so than the Zanadiqa wal Ash'ariya. More than the Ash'ari'a and or the Zanadiqa and the Ash'ari'a. Okay, that's, that's what Ibn Qudama al Maqdisi said about the Ash'ari'a. That he doesn't know any group, okay, from al bidah So he viewed the Ash'ari'a of al bidah No problem. That's his view. No one's denying that at all. But the point here is that he didn't have to join Salahuddin al-Yubi Rahmatullah's army. He was in Salahiyah. He didn't have to. Salahuddin al-Yubi Rahmatullah controlled at Damascus, controlled a sham. So now what I'm going to do is, okay, one alim, no problem. You want to take that approach? No problem. I'm going to show you now how Ibn Taymiyyah, how his approach was, okay? And this is going to shock you to your very core. As you can see on screen. So what I'm going to show you now is the contrast between Ibn Taymiyyah and the Salafis of today. Because I take this approach, okay, of Ibn Taymiyyah. So you can't call me a deviant because you, then you have to call Ibn Taymiyyah a deviant. This is the approach I take and this is where the Silver Salafis and the Madakina conveniently ignore how uh, Ibn Taymiyyah was so different to these um, waste papers. And on top of that, Muhammad Abdul Wahab was just a total takfiri as long with these bandits of the Da'wat al So as you can see on screen, وَالنَّاسُ يَعْلَمُونَ أَنَّهُ كَانَ بَيْنَ الْحَنْبَلِيَّةِ وَالْعَشَرِيَّةِ وَحْشَةٌ وَمُنَافَرَةٌ He says that people know that there's like a kind of an alienation and a bit of an animosity between the Hanbalis and the Ash'aris. We know that. Atharis, Hanbalis, you can say the same thing in, in Creed. What did Ibn Taymiyyah rahmatullah alayhi say? SubhanAllah, this is going to burn as you can see with the arrows over. He says, وَأَنَا كُنْتُ مِنْ أَعْظَمِ النَّاسِ تَعْلِيفٌ لِقُلُوبِ الْمُسْلِمِينَ and I was of the one that strove to reconcile the Muslims' hearts and unify them. Let me just stop there for a second. Ibn Taymiyyah is saying that the people know that there's some animosity. No doubt about it, we can see in our times as well that there is animosity between the Atharia or the, the, the Hanbali in terms of creed. I, I class myself as the Athari in creed, but you could say Hanbali, I'm a Hanbali in creed, no problem, because of Imam Ahmed. So there's animosity, okay? And there's alienation between the two, as we can see today. So what was Ibn Taymiyyah's approach, okay? Because your approach is Al Bidah, these guys are deviants. But Ibn Taymiyyah is saying, what did he say? He says, Wa ana kuntu min min nasi ta'lifan li qulub al Muslimin. He says, I was the one that strived to reconcile the Muslims' hearts and unify them. And what? Unify them. Okay? So, <laughs> Ibn Taymiyyah was, is free from you. Minions. It's got nothing to do with you. What else does Ibn Taymiyyah say? As you can see on screen. He says, وَطَلَبًا لِإِتِّفَاقٍ كَلِمَتُهُمْ وَإِتِّبَاعًا لِمَا أُمْرِنَا بِهِ مِنْ إِعْتِصَامِ بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ Wallah! Ibn Taymiyyah is saying, he goes, I was the one that wanted to strive and reconcile between the Muslims and their hearts and unify them in relation to the agreement in their speech. Okay? To have an ittifaq in their speech. Okay? And following what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
commanded us to hold on to the rope of Allah Azza wa Jal. What does Ibn Taymiyyah say? وَأَزَلْتَ عَامَةَ مَا كَانَ فِي النُّفُوسِ مِنَ الْوَحْشَةِ He said, and I was the one that removed most of these sort of issues or the alienation that existed in the heart. Okay? And then he further goes on to say, because I, I, I obviously made mention that the uh, Al-Ashari was one of the one, was one of the what? من أجل المتكلمين منتسبين إلى الإمام أحمد بن حنبل. He was one of the most noble of the uh, متكلمين. Subhanallah. Adeem. So let's repeat back uh, what Ibn Taymiyyah said. He said that the people know, okay, that I was the one that strived hard, okay, to bring about uh, what's it called uh, reconciliation between the hearts of the Ash'ari and the Hanbaliya or the Athariya. Uh, it, which is the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to hold on to the rope. And I removed most of the issues or the alienation that existed between the hearts, etc. So, where was... So now I ask you, why don't you take the example of Ibn Taymiyyah rahmatullahi This is what I strive for. I don't agree with the Ash'ari. I don't at all. Totally disagree with them as an Athari. But I can be mutual. And I want to solidify and unify and remove all the issues that we're having to the best of our abilities. We'll disagree, no problem. There's no issue at all to disagree. And, and that's what uh, has been happening for thousands of years between the Ashariya and the Athariya or the Hanbalis. Uh, no problem. That we can strive to get along. And Ibn Taymiyyah is saying this. Ibn Taymiyyah is saying that he strove for the Muslims to get along. Ibn Taymiyyah is saying this. So why haven't you taken this approach? Okay? So if I take this approach, this is the approach of Ibn Taymiyyah. So what's your problem? As you can see, we've got the book al Lawami'ah. Al Anwar, okay? And Imam Safarini says that Al Sunnah wal Jama'ah are three different groups. Al Athariyatu wa Imamuhum Ahmad bin Hanbal. That the Athari's whose leader is Ahmad bin Hanbal, and the Ash'aris whose leader is Abu, Abu Has, Abul Hasan al Ash'ari, and the third one is Al Maturidi whose leader is Abu Al Mansur al Maturidi, okay? So coming back to me now, so no problem. Okay, look. Oh, Imam Ibn Qudama held the uh, view that the Asha'ara al bida No problem. He held that view. No one's denying that. And I'm telling not taking that away from uh, Ibn Qudama. No problem. But I hold the view of Imam Safarini. And who is Imam Safarini? I've got a book here. So as you can see, I've got the book here, Al Ajwibatul Najdiya and As'ila Al Najdiya. Now, what is this book? Imam Safarini was in Asham. The people of Najd, even in the time of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, when the Da'wat al Najdiya was at his highest, okay, because he was living around that time. They wrote questions to him. That's how much of an imam he was. That's how much of an imam he was. They wrote questions to him, okay, Imam Safarini. Even though Muhammad Abdul Wahab and the, uh, the Takfiri Da'wat and Najdi were around at the time. This is the caliber of the man. So no problem. You could hold the view that Imam Qudama held the uh, view that, uh, that the uh, Sha'ara al-Bida. No problem. I hold the view of Imam Safarini that they're not from al-Bida. They're from Ali Sunnah Jama'ah, generally speaking. Because like I said, Aqidah is general and it's comprehensive. And the general framework is that the Ali Sunnah wal Jama'ah, the Asha'ar and the Maturidiyya and Athariyya are inclusive of that. Generally speaking, obviously they are part of that framework. Jahmiyya are not, Shia are not, Mu'tazila are not, Qadariyya are not, Khawarij are not, Mushabbiha are not. All of these are not from the general framework of Ali Sunnah wal Jama'ah. The Ashariyya are part of Ali Sunnah wal Jama'ah. They are part of this body. Okay, yes, we, we have issues with them in terms of Asma wa Sifat, in terms of uh, that particular side, but that don't kick them out of Ali Sunnah wal Jama'ah. You can do, no problem. I take the view of Imam Safarini. You can't impose your methodology upon us. Enough's enough now. And we're showing you that there's enough evidences from our side to prove our position, and we are firm upon this, and we are very clear in our statements that enough's enough. And we are responding back to you academically, academically. So my next video will be, as you can see the thumbnail, will be responding to Abu Mus'ab. Okay, Abu Mus'ab Wajdi Akari, if I pronounce his name wrong, I apologize. And this will be a very lengthy video, very lengthy video. And um, to be honest, I don't want to say much uh, because I'll leave that for the video. Um, distortions, technicalities, half-baked quotes, lies, uh, deception, just, just put it that way. That's what it's going to cover. And... Let me tell you, you're not very liked, mate. <laughs> Even when I was responding to all the rest of the box sets, uh, your name was getting mentioned quite a lot, but I was too busy. Um, but now you, you were getting brave. Uh, you, you were, you, your demeanor is absolutely diabolical. Um, we'll address that in the video. Don't worry about it. We'll show you, uh, you know, your videos and we'll show you your 
blatant blatant disregard for the for the classical statements and the transmission of those statements the reality of those statements the context um you know me by now you know me you better watch out like you know when when haji uh makes a thumbnail that means the script's ready and when the script's ready you know i bring evidences you know that okay you know that so don't worry about it we'll show you and the people will be enlightened and the people will say yeah he's just like the rest of them they already know that anyway <laughs> but once the videos uh, and you know my video have, large, uh, have uh, catastrophic impact on those betrayers and distorters of knowledge so uh, your turn's next okay so take care of yourselves wa sallallahu alayhi wa muhammad وتحدر الدمع وضاقت برؤى كم مرة عصفت أنكين بداخلي كم مرة قضاك كلبي من أساه حتى وكم كرهت